It is time for the first official monument of the year. And the longest of them too, Milano San Remo will take place for the 113th time this Saturday, the 19th of March. So put the date in your diary, set your alarms early, because we will have our pre-race breakaway show building up to all of the action from 8.30 a.m. GMT on GCN Plus. The show and the race will be live and on demand in all GCN Plus territories, except New, New Zealand. Zealand. Apologies once again. Uh, coming up, all you need to know about the route, a run through of the favourites and the outsiders, plus our predictions for the win. But first up, let's have a montage to get us all in the mood. Meters to go. Kwiatkowski's coming round. Sagan's going to be beaten. It's Kwiatkowski who's going to do it. It's just an incredible feeling. I still can't believe it, you know. Vincenzo. Impresa. 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 Junior La Philippe is extremely fort and he's going to s'impose sur Milan San Remo. Bernard is now driving it over. Philippe comes up and over the top. Bernard responds. It's Mano Mano side by side. The best finale in all of cycling. Right then, let's start with the route. We probably don't go into too many details because not much has changed over the years. No, 298 kilometres starting in Milan. Finishing in San Remo. Exactly. It's a Ron Seal race, <laughs> isn't it? A reference, that I guess, will mean nothing to anyone outside of the UK. No. The first crucial sector is the neutralised section before the official start, because <laughs> the riders have to navigate through the outskirts of Milan with all of its tram lines. Yes, and we're kind of joking, but there have been instances in the past where riders haven't made it to kilometre zero for the official start because they've crashed on the said <laughs> tram lines. Uh, but the first true test comes after around 120 kilometres of racing, and that is the Paso del Turquino. Yeah, and it's not particularly hard on paper, but it is the longest climb of the day, and also along with the sheer length of the race, it serves to sap a bit more energy from the legs before the crucial parts of the race a few hours later. The next leg sappers are those three capi on the Ligurian coastline. Uh, the first of them comes with just under 60 kilometres remaining, and whilst they look like absolutely nothing on the race profile, coming after 240 kilometres of racing, they do still hurt, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah, positioning from that moment onwards is key, because I'll soon hit the Cipressa, the foot of which comes with 27 kilometres to go, 5.6 kilometres long at a 4% average gradient. On that climb last year, they averaged 34 kilometres per hour for the 10 minutes it took them to go up the Cipressa, although that is some way off the record, which was set in 1996, at close to 37 oh. kilometres per hour average. Well, they must have had a tailwind that day, must not yeah, they? Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. Uh, now, we haven't seen any race-defining attacks on the Cipressa for quite some time, but we did see this daredevil descent from Niccolo Bonifacio in 2019. Do not try that at home, kids, or anybody else for that matter. <laughs> no. Now, whilst the Depressa no longer seems to produce race-winning moves, it does normally serve to create an initial selection. Then a fast and technical descent takes them back down to the coastline, at which point any drop riders have got about seven kilometres of flat to get themselves back in the game. That is right, because after that, they hit the Poggio, which starts with 12 kilometers remaining. This one is 3.7 Ks at 3.9% and even faster. Last year, they shot up that at average speed just as short of 38 kilometers per hour, although that too is shy of the fastest ever time up the Poggio. 1996? No, 1995 actually, oh, Si. Fast decades, the 90s. It was a fast decade. A lot yeah. of tailwinds. <laughs> um, now, the Poggio is the last place for the pure climbers to make a difference, and so we can be almost certain that we'll see attacks here. Although last year the pace was so high that seemingly nobody was able to attack until very close to the top. No, and at the top of course starts the famous, or I guess infamous descent uh, back down to the coast again. Fast, frantic, crazy really. It's a descent like no other in the world of cycling because the margins are so small, 
desperation is at an all-time high. And coming straight off the back of a climb after 290 k's of racing, mistakes can be made down there. Yeah, so let's hope they all get to the foot of it safely this year. These do tend to, don't they? I mean, like, touch wood. Yeah, nothing major. A couple of skirmishes and a couple of people off the side, but nothing major, like you said, touch wood. Yeah, because the... It would be bad, mm. wouldn't it? Anyway, once they get to the foot, they have just three kilometres until they reach the finish line on the Via Roma. Three of the most exciting kilometres of racing each and every year. Mm. Some will risk it all with an attack, others will play it conservative, and much of the outcome rests on how many domestiques are left to ride for their leaders at that point. Yeah, in most years, not many. So we're going to have the ultimate game of poker, whilst everyone tries to assess who holds what cards and indeed who they're even playing well, against. That's right, yeah, because they can't often see who's at the back of the group by that point. It's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? And now before we get on to the race favourites, a quick look back at how it panned out 12 months ago. Nothing really happened on the Depressor, nor for most of the Poggio, as Sai was saying, but Alaphilippe did make a move towards the top of that climb, followed by Van Aert and eventually Van der Poel as well, but there were still over 10 riders at the front as they crested that final climb of the day. Pidcock tried his luck on the descent, but at the foot of it, Jasper Stuyven made his move. He would be caught, but only by Soren Crow Anderson, who promptly hit the front and then towed Stoive into the line. Yeah, it's a bloody good lead out, to be fair, <laughs> wasn't it, for a, a non-teammate, unfortunately. Uh, just a shame, I guess, that uh, Crow Anderson couldn't hold on for second place on the day, because that went to Caleb Ewan last year, who was absolutely flying uphill and downdale and in the sprint that year. He was. Um, I guess we could start with him when talking about the favourites yep. then, couldn't we? Um, as you say, he was incredible last year. Not only did he manage to stay in contact over the Poggio, he was right at the very front. Wasn't he with the best climbers? He was. Maybe too much so. I do wonder whether that was his undoing this time last year because everybody left in the race knew that he was still there and still in the mix and therefore everybody knew that he'd win if they took him to the line. So I just wonder whether had he stayed a little bit further back, even though he was feeling that good, he'd have been out of sight and then out of mind of the favourites within that group and others might have chased Jasper Sturven down towards the end. Uh, giving themselves a fighting chance in the sprint, not knowing that Ewan was there. Can you imagine how hard that would be? I know, yes. To not use your it. legs yeah. that you've got. Right, <laughs> anyway, we'll watch with interest, won't we? Um, from there, it's going to be interesting to see then if he does play things differently this time around and if he does have the same legs. Well, there's no reason that he shouldn't have the same legs as last year, because yes, he did pull out of Torino Adriatico after three stages this year, but he pulled out after just two I was looking back at last year, and he was still on great form when it mattered. He'll have Philippe Gilbert for company, yep. won't he, at Lotto Soudal. And let's not forget that Gilbert only needs San Remo to tick all of the monuments off. Um, although it is... It's kind of hard to see him completing them, isn't it, at this point in his career? I would agree with that, yes. Uh, last year's winner, Jasper Sturven, will lead Trek Segafredo. Not had any results to really write home about so far this season, although he was one of the few riders who managed to get to the end of Paris-Nice this year. <laughs> uh, his teammate, Mas Pedersen, has had results to write home about this year, but he's skipping San Remo in order to concentrate on the cobbled classics to come. Mm. Um, well, Van Arts will start the race as... The big favourite when he has, he does pretty much every race of the season. <laughs> uh, his results this year, they really are incredible, aren't they? If you include cyclocross, he's done 13 race days, finished in the top three on 10 of them. It's madness, isn't it? It's unbelievable. And he's been almost as consistent over the three times that he's participated at San Remo. A sixth, first and third over the last three years. Plus he's got Roglic and Laporte as backup on Saturday. He is the man to beat, but then I guess that presents its own challenges, doesn't it? As Peter Sagan knows only yes. too well. He's raced here 11 times. He's been top 10 nine times, top four seven times but has never won it, no. has he? Unfortunately, as well, he's shown little sign this season that he can to finally take that elusive win in San Remo. But then maybe he will do it when we least expect it. Maybe this is all one long game like Caleb <laughs> yes. Ewan. Big act all season. Uh, there are a lot of people, actually, who are saying that Tadej Pugacha could just ride away from everybody on the Poggio, particularly if it's been hard enough on the Cipressa. And you could see why we would all think that, but then he didn't manage to do it last time he competed here in 2020. Although he was only 21 
back then, and he's now at the ripe old age of 23. True, yeah, he's getting on a bit yeah. these days, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, almost part of it, you could say. Um, but in all seriousness, it might be that the race is ridden more aggressively this mm -hmm. time around by UAE Emirates to give Pogaccia the best possible chance. Certainly what quick step Alpha Vinyl boss Patrick Lefebvre seems to think. He was downplaying the chances of Fabio Jakobsen last week, saying that he might not even select him. No, controversial as ever, Patrick Lefebvre. In fact, as we record this, we are still uncertain of their seven-man team, but we can be sure that 29 winner Juno Alaphilippe will be there. He's yet to take a win so far this year, but he is a man that often seems to get things right on the big occasion, so you can never count him out. Absolutely not. Ineos Grenadiers going to have a few cards to play. Elio Viviani, 2017 winner, Mikhail Kwiatkowski. But I think a lot of eyes are going to be on Filippo Ganna and Tom Pidcock. True. They will. Uh, Ganna was the rider who set the pace, I think, most of the Poggio last year. But I think we're all hoping he'll be a bit, a bit more protected, have a bit more freedom this time around and be able to take his own chances. With Pidcock, hard to know really where his form is because he was solid at the opening weekend in Belgium, but then he didn't start Strade Bianca through illness and he hasn't raced since. No, they've also got Ethan Hayter as well, haven't they? Although positioning has been terrible this season, it has, hasn't it, yeah. in the bunch? Um, and that's not ideal. It's not the best race. race to be in a bad position. That's not really. Sure. Um, Sonny Colbrelli is going to be hoping that he is over the illness that took him out of Paris-Nice and he'll be leading the Bahrain victorious team with Matteo Mahoric and will be hoping to become the first Italian winner since Vincenzo Nibali in 2018. Yeah, already four years ago now, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Uh, Nasser Buani, Arno Demar, Phil Bauhaus, Sam Bennett and Giacomo Nizzola are amongst the more pure sprinters that will be hoping that firstly they've got their climbing legs on and secondly a slightly larger group comes to the line. Whilst UAE Team, em UAE team Emirates, should I say, they've also got Matteo Trentin, haven't they? He could be hoping to take advantage of there being so much attention on today Pogaccia on the day. Yeah, he's had a couple of top tens he has, before, hasn't yes. he? Um, meanwhile, Alexander Kristoff, despite being a former winner, we're going to have to put him down as an outsider this year, yeah, aren't we? I think that's fair. Yeah, he will be leading into Marche, but I'm hoping that Biniam Gourmet will get some freedom in that team. Yeah. He can climb, he can sprint. It's almost the perfect race for him, isn't it? How good would that be to see Biniam Gourmet take the win in Milan and San Remo? Brilliant. Uh, Aaron Buru and Garcia Cortina look to be Movistar's best chances on Saturday, whilst Adi Dezir will be hoping that Greg Van Avermaet can turn the clock back. Yeah, and so too will Team DSM with 2015 winner John Degenkolb, while Soren Cry Anderson, who came so close to second place last year, as we said, will no doubt be aiming for another last-minute attack. Team Bike Exchange is going to be looking to Michael Matthews, although he's unfortunately caught in the position where he's not as fast in a sprint or as good as on the climbs as someone like Wout Van Aert. Well, let's be honest, pretty much everybody's in that situation, I True guess, that. aren't they? But that, that might be Van Aert's undoing, as we said a few moments ago. Oh, I forgot you said True That. Got one in late in the day True that. in this show. <laughs> anyway, that is the end of our favourites for the race and some of the outsiders. Hopefully we've mentioned every possible winner, but no doubt we've missed the rider that will eventually cross the line first on Saturday. Undoubtedly. Just before we get on to our own predictions, though, a reminder that free to view on the GCN app will have written previews from Milan San Roma across all six of our core languages. So that's English, Spanish, French, Italian, Japanese and German. I ran out of fingers, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, they'll be up towards the back end of this week, so keep your eyes out for them on the app. Uh, and we also have an article, actually, that we're running in the daily news slot this weekend, titled, Filippo Ganna can win Milano San Remo, and here's how. I'm sure that Ganna will be reading that one with much interest, won't well, he, this week? Well, so will all the other riders in the peloton, because then they know how to beat him. Well, true. Yeah, and on top of that, I've put my own case together, not about Filippo Ganna, but why Milano San Remo is the best race hands down on the whole calendar. So stay tuned for that this week. I've got a hunch that we might have quite a few comments underneath your video, Si. Yep, all in support after I've made such a good case to back <laughs> up my opinion. I mean, it is great though, isn't it? I mean, it yeah. is amazing. Nothing beats the excitement and unpredictability of the final 45 minutes of Milan Road. It never, ever disappoints. There's, it's just, it's just the ultimate climax to any bike race. Mm. Well, I shall watch your video of interest, Si, and get back to you with an answer on that later. Don't troll me in the comments, Dan. I will be. <laughs> <laughs> right, then, time for our predictions. I'll let you go first, Si. One favourite, one outsider for you. OK. Tade Pogaccia is the favourite. And my outsider, I hope I can have him as my outsider, but Christophe Laporte. 
Yeah, you can have him as an outsider. Can I thank yeah, He's mate, never yeah. been in the top 10 of this race. No. Good pick, though, because like we've said about other riders, Laporte could take advantage of how much attention is on Van Aert, couldn't he? Absolutely. Right then, well, I am going to go for Van Aert. Very, very obvious pick. But with all of those qualities, with the form he's got, he's going to be in the mix, for sure. You think so? Isn't he, at the end? And my outsider... It is going to be Biniam Gourmet of Antomarche Wanzi Gobert. I think that would just be such an amazing story for yeah. this race. I would just love to see it happen. Right, well, we shall see who comes out on top this Saturday. Don't forget in the comment section down below, let us know your favourites for the first monument of the year and we'll see who gets it right. I would look forward to having your company throughout the race on Saturday, but we do understand if you can't be with us for the full seven hours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. See you then.